Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Valerie Martinez, and I um, am the Director of History and Literary Arts at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. The NHCC, as we call it, is dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and advancement of Hispanic, Latinx culture, art, and humanities, and we are a division of the State of New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. I'd like to acknowledge that New Mexico is comprised of the ancestral and unceded land of 19 sovereign Pueblo nations, as well as three Apache tribes and the Navajo nation. We are indebted to the original owners and caretakers of this land and to the land itself. We are also dedicated to engagement with complex issues of history, culture, and heritage. This kind of engagement is at the heart of cultural understanding and promotes a legacy that is dedicated to justice and reconciliation. I am joined tonight by staff members in my program, the History and Literary Arts Program, Anna Oremovich, who takes care of all the logistics for this series. Cassandra Osterloh, our NHCC Zoom tech and our NHCC librarian, and Patricia Perea, who's our HLA educator. So if you all wanna wave, um, this is the staff at, in HLA at the NHCC. We are super excited to launch this series, Perspectivas Modernas Latin America, in collaboration with the University of New Mexico Department of History, Center for the Southwest and Latin American and Iberian Institute. Liz Hutchinson and Liz, if you wanna wave, and I started cooking up the idea for a Latin America, Latin America series last fall and her colleagues and mine have been very generous in joining in. We're very grateful for this collaboration. From our perspective at the NHCC, we wanted to expand our history and literary arts program, programming even more deeply into countries outside the US with a focus not only on history, but on relevant and important contemporary issues. For these reasons, we're very excited to launch the series with Paulo Dutra on Brazilian rap and the grammar of the black existence. This late winter and spring, these talks will happen on the second Tuesday of the month through May we hope that you'll join us each time. Now I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Hutchinson with UNM, then we'll take care of a few housekeeping details, introduce our speaker, and he'll take it from there. Liz? Thank you, Valerie, and thank you everybody for joining us on the inaugural lecture in this series. I'm Liz Hutchinson, uh, Department of History at the University of New Mexico. And I'm very happy, along with my colleagues, Francis Hayashida and Sam Truitt, to join this uh, effort to uh, unify and collaborate with the NHCC. Um, the NHCC is a, a natural partner for us. I am a Circo Latino fanatic myself. Um, and it's somehow for many years that I've been at UNM has seen like we need to develop these um, connections and um, uh, talk more with the community and show uh, what UNM has uh, to offer and to learn from this community at the same time. So we're very grateful and I'm happy to welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, I'm Anna Uremovic and I will go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, our speaker will present for about 30 to 40 minutes followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. During the presentation, all of you will be muted so there's no background noise or interruptions. After the talk, we'll open up the chat box for questions and comments. We will field the questions and present them to our speaker. Right now, you may want to grab a pen and paper to write down questions that pop up during the presentation so that you can type them in the chat box later. At the end of the session, we will share details about next month's talk and also provide a link in the chat box that allows you to take a quick one minute feedback survey. The survey tells us about your experience with this event, enables us to be responsive to your needs. Thank you in advance for this. And now I'd like to introduce Francis Hayashida, director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico, who will introduce our speaker tonight. 
Thank you. Thank you. So I'm delighted to introduce Paolo Dutra, who is an assistant professor of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of New Mexico. In his talk, Brazilian Rap and the Grammar of the Black Existence, he'll examine the artistic production of the well-known Brazilian rap group, Racionais MC, to explore their poetically crafted understanding of how people of African descent experience and negotiate their existence in Brazil. Professor Lutra is also the author of a short story collection, Aversal Oficial Resumida, and of a poetry collection, Abliterações, which was a semi-finalist for the prestigious 2020 Oceanos Prize. He specializes in the inter intersections of race and artistic and cultural production in the Luso-Brazilian and Latin American context. And his scholarly work, his scholarly work on Don Quixote, race and Machado de Assis's work and Racionais MC's rap music has appeared in journals and book chapters in Brazil, Argentina and the United States. So please join me in welcoming Professor Paulo Dutra. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. I need to uh, share my screen. Okay, can you guys can you guys see it? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> wow, uh, <clears throat> it's 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 really an honor uh, to be here, and I I I think first things first, right? I would like to thank uh, the National Hispanic Culture Center, the Latin American and Iberian Institute. Uh, the Department of History of any, at UNM. And I also want to thank every single person who directly or indirectly uh, worked to make this happen today. Um, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and a special thanks to Francis Ayashida for introducing me. <laughs> uh, um, so I would like to, to get started by setting the theoretical frame framework of my of my presentation today because I put together um, several ideas that I have and I'm hoping that by the end they will make sense and come together and make sense. <clears throat> um, despite all the negative impressions that some may have uh, regarding hip hop music, I approach it in the terms that Michael Eric Dyson points out and I hope you can see it in the uh, PowerPoint. Hip hop is still fundamentally an art form that traffics in hyperbole, parody, kitsch, dramatic license, double entendre, signification, and, and, and all that, right? That's how I understand uh, poet, I mean rap. Rap is poet. Uh, also, as you can see, uh, in, my, um, in my work, again, I, try to apply these ideas um, because we do like criticism, right? So I try to apply these, these ideas too. Uh, hip hop, hip hop artists, they are very aware of what they are doing. Um, and that should, that should not even be a, a question, right? Do they know what they do? Um, <clears throat> so as you all can see, I will approach, approach rap today as poetry, basically. Now, maybe you are wondering about the title um, of, of this talk and what grammar has to do with hip hop. So I will try to explain it briefly. Um, again, we have a, a quote uh, from by uh, Tommy J. Curry. The negotiation of human existence with the word is not simply a retreat from the word, from the failures of that word or its tragedy. Rather, this negotiation is the fundamental expression of life, the living, the contradictions of human suffering that point out that philosophy must be an existentially rooted endeavoring to make life meaningful. Sometimes, if you are lucky, we get hip hop as a product and grammar of this particular existence. Um, and I'm, I'm asking you all here to understand grammar both at, as a set of rules to be followed, follow but also as a set of rules to be broken. Uh, because language is one, if not the main, uh, tool in this negotiation of uh, human existence that uh, Tommy Curry uh, talks about. And also given that hip hop's problematics take place on the lab of language, rap is indeed a poetic form that relies heavily on everyday speech 
and specific linguistic registers as raw material for the constructions of the lines. In the case of people of African descent, and I'm talking about Brazilian people, of course, yet another layer is added because of that notion proposed by James Baldwin that a black writer born into the English language must realize that the assumptions under which the language works are an enemy. And I, of course, am transporting this notion, this idea to Brazil and to Brazilian rappers. <clears throat> In order to make it a little uh, more uh, explicit, I will resort to, to some lyrics of the most famous rap group in Brazil, Racionais MCs. In Brazil, rap found a fertile place in the outskirts of the largest and richest city in the country, São Paulo. Some of you may, uh, may know it. I am admitting people into the room, okay? Oh. Um, <clears throat> um, so here you have some information on São Paulo. It's the largest city in Brazil. As you can see, the population is about to 12, 12 million, but if you count the metro is 21 million. Um, and if you count the macro met metropolis is 30, 33 million people. Sao Paulo is really huge. Most people that fly into Sao Paulo will tell you that it's a, it's a sea of, uh, of, uh, of uh, buildings. They never end. You are flying in and you see a, a sea of buildings, which is very different from where I am from, Rio de Janeiro. That's where uh, Hasionais and MCs are from. So they, that, those are uh, the, the people, the group, right? Mano Brown, Ice Blue, Eddie Rock, and DJ Kyle J. And you guys can see all the English uh, influence in, the, in their names, right? Um, one thing that's very interesting about uh, Hasionais and MCs is that one of their albums, Sobrevivendo no Inferno, Surviving Hell, from uh, 1997, it was actually made into a book. It was it is unprecedented in Brazilian history that a actually the album of rap music was made into a book. That's because that particular album was a required reading for the uh, university entrance in Campinas. So, and I don't know if you can see it, but Companhia das Letras is probably the most, uh, the biggest, the largest, the most powerful uh, press uh, in Brazil. So it's a big achievement in, in a way. Coming back to, to, the, to the lyrics, <clears throat> Adam Bradley pointed out some characteristics of rap that can easily be detected in racionalized raps, raps. And I quote, most often it express its meaning in quite plainly. Rappers refresh the language by fashioning pattern and heightened variations of everyday speech. Using everyday language as a point of departure for poetic creation may not only result in innovative, innovative <coughs> poetic forms using registers out of the mainstream, such as slang, but it goes beyond that because in avoiding traditional poetic devices, something new is, is created. For example, in Brazilian rap, hyperbaton, which is a syntactical inversion, right? You use, you, you invert the, the order of the words in, in, the, in the sentence, is a readily employed resource. The reason for this virtual non-existence is probably that in everyday language, people will not employ this figure of speech. The use of hyperbaton in traditional Brazilian poetry can probably actually be traced back, back to Baroque times. Um, <clears throat> And I'm showing you guys a, the first stanza of Brazilian, Brazil's national anthem, which is a clear example of the importance there's this specific device claim in the country's history. And I did that in purpose. I put that on Google Translator. The syntax is so uh, messed up that Google Translation Translator is unable to translate it. And I reword everything so you guys can see what it is. <clears throat> Um, even nowadays, this figure of speech can be found abundantly in the works of poets who believe it can result in a more magnificent, magnificent poetic expression. Hyperbaton is present in probably 99% of traditional poetry in Brazil. Rap, however, operates under a set of poetic rules of <coughs> construction that very seldom are the same of what we are uh, on, of we 
what we understand by conventional poetry. Rapper Juba, for instance, not only believes that standard language creates artistic limitations, but also that it produces, produces a mindset which clouds the understanding of rap really ly lyrics for people, and I quote, that live by this language and thrive by this language, standard language. <clears throat> Let's go, uh, let's go to some lines from the Hassanized MCs track, um, from Hassanized MCs, right? Um, and I'll play some for you guys so to give you a little <laughs> That's That's what Portuguese sounds like. The lack of hyperbaton is just, a, is just as manifestly obvious as the lack of number agreement. However, rather than being a deficiency, the, that lack of both conventional poetic and grammatical device creates the artistic space in which the rapper refreshes the language of everyday speech. The word K, that means what, and of course, what has no plural, right? The word K comes in the plural form kes, pronounced keys. And as, and as sociolinguistics uh, have already, <clears throat> have already uh, noticed, the way uh, such constructions, people in the waiting room trying to enter, admit. The way such constructions developed in Brazilian Portuguese, the plural expressed in the word case in conjunction with the definite article os before omens, we will eliminate the need for the repetition. The displacement of the plural marker, an everyday practice for the majority of native speaker of Brazilian Portuguese, uh, frees the rapper from observing the normative grammar, which would make the lines unauthentic and uh, as a result, completely ru ruin them. <clears throat> it is also worth noticing that while rapping AD rock el elongates the duration of nasal uh, phonemes in order to compensate for a missing syllable. Uh, this disobedience to normative grammar does not prevent a listener from understanding the level of dissatisfaction, which is in fact expressed quite plain with the inappropriate way law enforcement personnel harass blacks, black people, and disrespect the personal values. I refer both to the famous DWB, if you guys don't know what DWB is, now is the famous driving while black, <clears throat> or yeah, which is the car inspection without probable cause and the subsequent profanation of for many Brazilians, a symbol as sacred as a favorite soccer team's jersey. You guys can see the Santos jersey and the cap, the white cap. The episode is narrated through a, com a complexly engineered combination of phonemes, especially sibilants, those of and the poetic possibilities. The above quote, quote is a demonstration against the white society in general, and I quote, Curry participates in a moral and political condemnation of the symbols, language, and prose black folks use to express their lives. Hassanized MC's track, Magic, Magic, of, Magic Formula for Peace, delivers one of the best depictions of how black people experience some of the legacies of slavery. In roughly 10 minutes, in 30 seconds, Manu Brown roams over the specificities of living as a black person in a particular geographic scenario, the south side of Sao Paulo. Not only does he address the topic, but also the poetic construction that relies heavily in the harmonic combination of background sounds with the rhymes generates a quite unique effect. A sort of humming sound with emphasis on uh, variants of the Portuguese vowel, vowel u, 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 can be heard throughout the whole track, preparing the listener to what's probably the most beautiful and meaningful part of the lyrics. They seen at the cemetery where women who share a common trait can be easily spotted. And that's the song I'm talking about. <laughs> I hope you 
fourth derivative here, the who, 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 who these lines um, comprise the whole history of black mothers struggle, struggle against what is probably the most painful material and symbolic inheritance that are felt in the everyday life of black diasporic cultures. The lines are clearly based on the assonance, as I said, of the U. Assonance is a repetition of vowels, right? Which aside from reverberating with the continuous background humming, imprints a gloomy tone to the scene. It is also imprinted in the humble clothing and the downcast faces, which are a result of an entire life of hardship. The tone the poetry sets is a perfect match for the situation being depicted. Black women gathered at the cemetery in order to visit the tombs of their deceased sons. sons. But remember, there are flowers. It ends with flowers, right? So there is another uh, element. <clears throat> As you can see, Hashanah's MEC's lyrics introduce sociological commentary and political criticism. However, the artistic means and conventions through which they get their point across are not less important. In order to further elaborate on the artistic means, I will show you all one more example. <clears throat> A suspenseful beat followed by a drum and a pandero, a tambourine, music instruments that they, they are related to samba, uh, get the track started and announce the somber scenario the lyrics will discuss. <clears throat> From the very beginning, Hassanize states that the target of racist attacks are poor people. Therefore, the message is clear. Black people in Sao Paulo are the lower social class. Because class struggle within African-American society exists, Boyd believes that, and I quote, more often than not, questions of race dominate popular, both popular and critical discussions about rap music here in the United States. Though this discussion is, um, is important, contemporary society, especially the post reagan Bush era, forces all, us to deal with the influence of the class struggle on African-American society. The opposite path is the more urgent one in the case of Brazilian rap criticism. In, in Brazil, they, they focus on class struggle and they do not focus on, on, on race, in, on Brazilian rap. Um, through the discussion on, on, on class, although the, the discussion on class struggle are important, of course, Contemporary re-examination re of the history of the rather uncordial race relations in Brazil should force us all to deal with the patent and central place race has in the aesthetics of Brazilian rap. And I have been um, talking about this for a long time. I don't know if they are listening to me. Gradually, <clears throat> the racist suckers with racist otários identity is revealed through linguistic clues until the moment that there is no doubt that they are law enforcement personnel who fulfilling a higher powers mission, frame black people in a daily basis in order to send them to prison. It is a verified fact that I myself witnessed, witnessed several times, it is a fact that corrupt police officers carry illegal substances on them, usually drugs, to plant on people whenever they feel like it. Only after having set the tone and the scenario uh, through the background sounds and the rhythm the line deliver, that's when racionais get to the point they want to get across. The rhythm is marked by an overemphasis of most of the stress syllabus in perfect synchrony with the background beat sound. Such an attention to detail reveals from the beginning the concern with the artistic expression as a foundation for the message they want to convey. Although the system is cruel and racist, and I quote, sociologists prefer to be impartial. And they say our dilemma is financial, which is a no discussion and an axiomatically imposed notion that can be tracked back to the rise of the myth of racial democracy. 
As soon as I challenge such a notion by embodying a we, in other words, the actual people who leaves the attacks in a daily basis, in opposition to sociologists who coldly analyze the issue from a theoretical perspective, which is detached from objective reality, in their opinion. Mas se analisamos bem mais, você descobre que negro e branco pobre se parecem, mas não são iguais. The lingering myth of racial democracy and its impact on Black people's thought is what nationalists are ultimately discussing. Because systematically, they point out throughout the lyrics the issue of misinformation that keep Black people believing that any possible legacy of slavery has been eliminated by the abolition in 1888. Therefore, therefore <clears throat> Black people are unable to see through the fallacy, the last fallacy, of the racial democracy and blame themselves for the predicament they find themselves in. According to Hassanais, however, I think, I, yeah. Nossos motivos para lutar ainda são os mesmos, o preconceito e o desprezo ainda são iguais, nós somos negros, também temos nossos ideais, assista os otários, nos deixem em paz. I inverted one of on the slides, sorry. <laughs> um, once more, to the embodiment of a we, Hassanais state explicitly that black people are not fully integrated to Brazilian society, regardless of impartial, impartial sociologists' claims to the contrary. The fight is still active, and so are the reasons to fight, because, as they say, the powerful are disloyal, disloyal cowards. They beat blacks on the streets for no reason. Os poderosos são covardes, desleais, espancam negros nas ruas por motivos banais. At this point, the lyrics states explicitly that the racistas otários, the racist suckers, are not the only problem, but part of a larger and complex system of reality that lead black people to forget the rebellions, fights, and deaths of the enslaved ancestors in their quest for freedom and equality. Racionais resort to a we in order to denounce that while black people's inaction, which is represented by the crossed arms in the face of the ideological imposition in the lyrics, is deeply rooted, they, the police or whoever they are, are act actively cruising the streets, looking for the users, usual suspects whose phenotypical attributes are unequivocal. Brazilian legislator Afonso Arino's anti-racism bill, which is considered one of the first attempts to legally punish racist act, is now 70 years old and has been overcome by more strict ones that clearly define racism as a serious crime instead of a misdemeanor. In 1990, nonetheless, it was the only constitutional law dealing with racism available. <clears throat> as soon as brought up, into question the concrete lack of impact of such a law in the everyday lives of people of African descent. Once more, contra contrasting the distance between the theoretical and the objective word, they define it, the law, and I quote, as inf infallible in theory, useless in everyday life. Infallible na teoria, inútil no dia a dia. Furthermore, as a nice plainly summarized the issue of racism in, racism in Brazil, which in theory does not exist. We are all happy, we all, we all love each other, <laughs> but it remains effective. The discussion of the, of the fissure between the theoretical and the actual everyday realm can only be achieved through art. Because just like James Baldwin, I love James Baldwin, he once said, the artist is somebody that help us see reality again. Racionais' aesthetic goal is in racistas otários is an attempt at making black people see reality again by creatively elaborating on the gap between the two realms in the more approachable language, aesthetic, and grammar that hip hop music provides. The lyrics, ends by, the lyrics end by repeating and reaffirming black people's existence as black people in a racist society but not before delivering 
the final and this time sarcastic blow on the myth of racial democracy's rash, democracy rationale, which claims that Brazil is a country with a suitable climate to nature racial integration where there is no uh, racial prejudice. O Brasil é um país de clima tropical, onde as raças se misturam naturalmente e não há preconceito racial. <risos> Such a message is delivered in a solemn, declamatory, and scholarly tone, the last one, right? But it is immediately interrupted in an overlapping effect by the worldwide famous laughter from Michael Jackson's song Thriller. This is not only a fine example of sampling, which is, according to Dyson, I quote, a transgressive activity because rappers employ it to interrupt the narrative flow and music stability of other musical texts. But it is also an orchestrated construction that poetically deals with form and content. This is what the sampling delivers, in my opinion. Another level of artistic effect, I explain. In this case, the resource of sampling is transplanted from the realm of music into the realm of the ideological arena. What is really being interrupted is not a music, but the narrative flow and speech stability of the myth of racial democracy. The laughter mocks the arrogant and fallacious content and form of scholarly discourse and language and grammar. But the laughter also lasts around two seconds more, I clocked it, than the speech. It is not interrupted until it is completely over, artistically claiming more importance, and ultimately prepares the listener to return to the lines that have already been sung, and that will be the closing remarks along with the refrain line, which is also the first and the last lines of the rap. Nossos motivos para lutar ainda são os mesmos, o preconceito e o desprezo ainda são iguais. Nós somos negros, também temos nossos ideais, racistas otários nos deixam em paz. <coughs> racistas otários does not engage the issue of self-destruction, which Hassanaz MCs later addressed in another track, the Fórmula Mágica da Paz, the magical formula of peace that I talked about before, from the later album. Uh, Racistas Otários is from a previous album. It's not the same uh, sobre o Bem no Inferno. But it does pave the road for future lyrics. At that point in the 90s, 19, 1990, uh, at that point in their career, the group seemed to see the negotiation of Black people's existence from a different angle. And at that point, the elaboration itself of a particular artistic language was intrinsically a part of such a negotiation. The grammar of their particular existence was being built within their artistic development. <laughs> Hence, the choice of artistically discussing the daily harassment of law enforcement agencies, the passiveness of some Afro-Brazilians, and the fall fallacy of the myth of racial democracy which are all a continuation of the radicalization that the dictatorial state implemented for several years. There was a radicalization on, um, uh, of violence, I guess, against Afro-Brazilians during the uh, dictatorial state. It was worse uh, than, I mean, more, far worse, right? It was always bad, but it was far, far worse. Don't, don't get me wrong. The group witnessed the so-called redemocratization process with the transition from the dictatorship to democracy in which black people continue to experience the radicalization of the everlasting symbolic and real violence 
that the authoritarian government revived. Slavery and its legacies added one more and crucial element in the negotiation of people of African descent existence in this continent. Becoming black and what it implies has been a fundamental expression of life for the people that such a context products produced. In the case of Hassan and Mises, <clears throat> I think we are lucky because their raps are a product and a grammar of black people's existence in Brazil. Rapping itself is one of the expressions of life that is constantly negotiated. Thank you. <clears throat> Yay, I think you can unmute yourself so we can hear the applause for Paulo. It's always nice to be able to do that. Thank you so much. Paolo, and um, if you have questions, this is a great time to, to type them into the chat. And if you don't mind, Paolo, I, I would like to start because there's so much going on here. So I'm gonna to try to ask this question and not confuse you. <laughs> so um, the, the race and class thing is very interesting to me. And I wanted to, you know, in the United States, we have a history of protest poetry and protest music, right? Um, and the playing with syntax is something that with new poetic movements happens, right? When we moved from formal poetry to free verse, right? There was a revolution against the traditional syntax. So I'm interested in um, rap is, it's, is the newest kind of movement. And so some of the things that you're talking about in terms of the way it particularly in Brazilian rap plays with the syntax, can you talk a little bit about what's different about contemporary rap that kind of distinguishes it from protest poetry or does that make sense? Um, yes. Um... Um, I think, well, in the case of Brazil, right, I think what different, differentiates rap from um, the other uh, types of uh, protest, uh, poetry, and, and, and music is the language. <laughs> um, a good rap, a good rapper will never resort to any kind of, um, you know, um, how can I say that? Um, they will not resort to any kind of a, like a scholarly discourse unless they are making fun of it, unless they are mocking it. They will not be uh, trying to talk like a beautiful language. They will, they will sing as they speak. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to talk about this with, with people who are so um, into traditional poetry um, because they think they will think that rap music is just easy to make. It's not. I dare any traditional poet <laughs> to write a poem without resorting to all the traditional uh, um, um, resources that, they, that they, they usually do and just write poetry with every, really everyday language and make it, and make it rhyme if they want to and make it be meaningful and make it be, uh, and make it be like uh, um, pleasant to people. It's really hard. I have tried, I'm not a rapper, I'm a poet. Uh, and I have been trying, uh, rap influences my poetry. I have been trying to, to write poet as if I was writing a rap. I have no uh, <laughs> talent to, <laughs> to write a, a rap, I can't. Um, and if you think about the, the, the mindset, right? Uh, traditional, uh, if, you can, if you can call that traditional, traditional uh, protest songs, protest poetry, uh, they are inserted in the very system they are um, trying to, to, to argue with. And they use the same language, the same grammar, the same uh, rules. Um, so I would say like to try to be um, uh, specific on the questions, the very language of rap that makes rap different 
from uh, any other kind of uh, uh, protest, poet, and song. And again, I'm not saying that rap is better or that rap is not is inferior. They are both great. They are just different. Great, thanks. Anybody so else can... have a question? <laughs> yeah, Mark. I... Um, thank you, Paulo. Um, I I wondered if you talk a little bit about the relationship, in a way, between the beat of the words and the beat of the music and how sometimes they agree and it looks like sometimes they don't or, or the sampling, just the complexity it seems to me of, of how it's not just background music, right? Like elevator music, there's, there's a reason for it. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, um, thanks. Um, so rap, rap, I'm, I'm approaching rap as poetry, but of course, rap's not it's not only poetry. Uh, every everything everything that is involved in rap is is important. But here we're talking about a studio album, right? They go to the studio, they they write, they probably record things separately, then they put they, they put it together. Um, ideally, right? Uh, we should see someone performing. The rap with everything because then you can see the body language you can see everything uh, so as a, i think as a musical resort as a techn, uh, technological um, uh, way of of um, trying or trying to convey the meaning and the and the dexterity the the art, 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 artistically speaking um, they use the Back, let's let's call them the background sound to interfere with the the, the very uh, language they are using, uh, and it's not it's not like you, you said the sampling, like and I was talking about the sampling and the scratch and all that. They are we need to think about those things as okay. Let's 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 say we're talking about other music, right? Those things, they are the instruments, like they are the violin, they are the, the, the tambourine, they are the, the, the guitar, they are the uh, however, uh, whatever instrument uh, we can think about it. Uh, they are the orchestra, right? The, those sounds. And they are, and rap was born because of technology, right? Because of the turntables and all that thing, all this, all that the technology rap, rap was born out of that uh, as, as, as music. Um, and I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not really an expert in, in, uh, in music itself. I'm just start to learn the violin and all that. Um, but I, I see the metaphor that I use to try to understand is that Every, everything that you hear in, the, in, the, in the, the background is like every single different instrument in an orchestra. And so they come together. And of course they manipulate it when they put the, in the study, right? In the, in the studio, in the al studio album, they manipulate that like some kind of montage in, in, a, in a movie. So again, it, it only proves that's a very in, uh, intricate process. <laughs> of combining sounds with the rhythm and what you're saying and the way you're saying. And I just got confused and I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you're, you're talking about multiple forms of discourse, right? That's what we might say in academia. And there's disruption. We've talked about disruption, but there's also sarcasm, commentary, and and so is that a good way for me to understand that? If I, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I think it, it, it's great. Um, and also, um, there is it it, it it creates distraction for people who are not used to the music because rappers, you know, back in the time they'd be like, I'm not singing for you. I'm singing for me and my group and my crew and people around me. We know what we're doing. We understand the disruptions. We understand the sounds. The sounds are familiar to us. Usually, back in time, they were like uh, 
you know, gunshots, uh, tires, like, and, and sounds of the ghetto, sounds of the, of the, and of course the music. In the case of Brazilian music, uh, in Brazilian uh, hip hop, there is another component that they use traditional Brazilian uh, black music too. So in that sense, uh, the Brazilian rap is, is a little different from um, um, American rap. Uh, although if you ask the Brazilian rappers, they will say, no, American rap is way better. They are way more advanced than us. We are just learning. But uh, the, the, the culture of Brazil, the music of Brazil, the sounds of Brazil, they are also incorporated, of course, along with the, the worldwide famous sounds, Michael Jackson's laugh, uh, laughter in that, that song, and of course, uh, American music uh, as basis, like for the for the for some of the the the, the, the raps that they they recorded. Great. I think I think I need to get out and talk to people because you know I don't I don't talk to anyone, so I I'm not even able to speak English anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read a question and then Marina, I see that your hand is up, but let me read something from the chat. This is from Doug, I think. He says, rap is often described as a new form, but it's been with us for almost 30 years. I've struggled to open my ears to it as a music poetry form, but no success. I just heard some from a car this morning and it just sounds violent. In contrast, NHCC has sponsored some spoken word and poetry slam events where the language stands without music. I feel immediate impact. So the question is, how can I do better opening my ears to the sound which has conquered the world? <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for the question. That's a great question. I think it's common to, to, to think that sounds violent and all that. But that has to do with, with uh, signifying mode. Um, I, I may try to explain signifying mode later uh, if you guys need to, but it's just like, it's a double voice. Like I said, they are making that, they are not interested that you are gonna, you, me, or we scholars, that we are gonna like it or even pay attention to it. It was not uh, their intention. They are actually trying to make you not understand. So like with the pandemic, like I said, I don't talk to anybody anymore. We only speak in, in Portuguese, Spanish in the house, uh, a little bit English too. Uh, I, I am learning the violin and I am learning the, uh, to jump rope. <laughs> um, and uh, I have been trying to learn jump rope for a long time. And I have been trying to learn the violin for a long time. And I, sometimes I feel like you. So what do I need to do? What do you need to do? You need to listen more rap every day, every day, every day. That's how I developed my, my taste, my critical approach. I listen to rap music every day. I specifically um, listen to rap music from the 90s, more specifically Hassanize MCs and NWA and Ice Cube. Uh, I concentrate on them and again, it's like reading the book over and over again because you have to write a paper. It's like reading and rereading a poem that you like, you memorize it, you learn how to, to how to integrate yourself. I would be lying if I could if I tell you that I I am able to listen to and make uh, and construct meaning from every single sound back 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 uh, in the back of that song, and I have been listening to that song for. 20 years maybe, I don't, but what do we do? We, we keep learning, we keep listening to it, we keep uh, trying to, uh, to immerse ourselves, ourselves into that. And again, right, if we talk about Don Quixote, we can, we can talk about Don Quixote forever. We will never <laughs> exhaust Don Quixote, right? We will never exhaust the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. We will never exhaust that because it is a very, very um, two different things, but they are an extremely well constructed uh, piece of art. And rap, what I'm trying to show that rap, it is also, it's just different. It's just a different um, um, uh, discourse, 
a different dialogue, a different uh, um, media. Thank you for that. That's it, the whole thing's been very helpful. Thank you very, especially to really see the depth and the thought that goes into it. Thank you. Thanks. I I am I am learning to enjoy uh, classical music because my my violin instructor he he, he tells me I know you want to play like popular songs, but you need to learn that too. I'm like okay, I'm gonna listen to classical music. <laughs> Great. So Marina, and then we have a question in the chat by Liz after that. Okay, uh, Professor. Um, Brazilian of the 90s, it's such a good, uh, it's such a different space as Brazilian as it is right now, right? Uh, uh, so the 90s when those uh, musics, oh, those raps were written, it was a different world, right? As we know. Uh, what do you think about rap nowadays in Brazil? And what does it reflect? Does it reflect the same issues? <laughs> Professor, I see you're laughing at my question. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm laughing at myself because I. I thanks, Marina. I try to emphasize this. I studied the '90s, right? And I and there is there are uh, historians here. I I heard one time from one uh, history professor. Why they asked him? Why don't we talk about what happened yesterday? He said, "That's not history." <laughs> <laughs> you need perspective, you need time to, <laughs> to analyze. Um, anything that I say about rap in Brazil right now is gonna be a opinion on my taste. It's not a um, analysis, uh, you know, a scholarly analysis of rap. Uh, I, 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 of course, I listen to rap music in Brazil uh, and also to some um, um, here in the United States and some in the world of course, rap is like a worldwide uh, uh, endeavor now. Um, I prefer the 90s. <laughs> and uh, there is also this rapper, Marechal, I think he's from Rio. He says, uh, he says something like, he says, que volte a época em que os MCs eram mais politizados. I hope we would go back to the time when the MCs, the rappers, they were more like political. They would, they would rap about issues and, 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 and political issues and all. But we do have uh, a, a great, uh, two great um, um, things, right? Women in rap, right? Uh, they are, I think right, right now, Marina, I would say, I know Emicida is very famous and all because of, of the, the documentary and all that, he's great, all the other rappers. But I think the, the most important thing and the most important difference is because is the, the, the space that female rappers are claiming because they have been in, the, in, the, in rap since the 90s. Um, there is one example, I'm not gonna remember her name. I'm trying to get in touch with her. Uh, um, but she was a rapper in the 90s, but only like recently, a year ago, she was able to finally like record one album. And uh, I don't think I need to, to tell you why, right? It's a sexist society and all that. Um, <clears throat> but I think in, in, in a sense, um, rap in Brazil did not achieve like the multi-billionaire industry <laughs> like it is here in the United States. Um, but they are, they are getting there. I think some of rappers, they are, um, um, they are able now to enjoy some prestige in the artistic community and uh, within the, the, the market, right? With the, the, they, they, they have a little more money now so they can uh, choose what they do. Just like uh, Manu Brau, for example, and Eddie Rock, Sometimes they, they still work together, but they are like working separately. They are doing other, other stuff. Uh, Manu Brau is not even uh, uh, doing rap anymore. He's doing all, experimenting with other uh, types of music because he says, firstly, I, I, I see myself as a musician, as someone that likes music. And back in time, that, that's what we had to talk about, 
right now, and you are right, Marina, right now we have to talk about other stuff. But I think to try to be concise, the most important difference is uh, uh, um, women uh, getting more attention and more space uh, uh, from the media and from um, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks. Liz, you want to ask your question? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Paolo, that was, that was great. I enjoyed it. Um, so I was re really intrigued about the juxtaposition or the interruption of the scholarly quote. Um, and I might've missed it, but, but what is the quotation from? Uh, I have my guesses, but I want you to tell me. Uh, and uh, the selection of that particular laugh from Thriller, whether you read anything in that particular sampling choice um, with, it, with respect to US rap and US music, Michael Jackson, pop culture, where, where, how, do you, how do you place that choice, if you know? Uh, well, there is an easy question, an easy answer in the, in the difficult one, right? I don't know. I don't know. How, I don't know how much you guys think or know Michael Jackson's famous around the world. <laughs> he's just, he's just, um, in spite of everything, right? And Dave Chappelle says he does not believe in that. All that, uh, in spite of all all that happened, Michael Jackson is still the king of pop. Is he's still the um, the most famous. Uh, American singer probably. And back in the 90s, um, that laughter, it was, it became part of Brazilian culture, Brazilian pop culture. Everybody knew that. And uh, that laughter was being used in several other uh, places, right? The quote, it, um, they say, you know, o Brasil é um país de clima tropical, and blah, blah, blah. It is just someone pretending um, pretending to, to talk like a scholar. And there is a contradiction there because uh, now after years, and I agree with them, Hasanai says that, that their language were not quite right for rap because they were just, at the beginning, they were afraid of you know, cursing and all that and giving a bad impression. Uh, and then, but, the later album, I think it's 2002, uh, it, is, it is just pure everyday speech, everyday language made into rap. Um, <clears throat> but that, that quote is like any, any, any professor in the 90s <laughs> probably would say that in Brazil. Like I said, the myth of racial democracy, it has been like, you know, we know that's not true and uh, one time I, I was trying to publish, I published a paper, but one of the reviewers said, you cannot say that the myth of Brazilian, uh, myth of racial democracy is a reality because we all know that doesn't exist. And I explained, yeah, it is a reality in everyday life. It does not exist because we as scholars, we know that it doesn't exist. Recently, the president of Brazil and the vice president, they, they, they just reinforced the idea of the myth of racial democracy. It still rules everyday life in Brazil, even though we know <laughs> there is no uh, racial democracy in Brazil. Um, so they were, and, and there was also at the time this um, the conversations on, on um, affirmative actions. There were conversations on affirmative actions that may be also um, um, a, a, a a discourse there a. a there may be a connection between the conversations on affirmative action in Brazil and what they do in the mute in the song with the racial democracy and, and all that. Uh, I think um, Marina, Marina can help me. I think uh, the affirmative action was instituted in 2002, I think, officially, but the conversations were uh, preceded uh, the, the institution, right? Uh, so there is also this possibility that they are talking about um, um, the conversations surrounding uh, affirmative action in Brazil. Because people will say, no, we don't need affirmative action. We are not racist. There's no racism. We are uh, all a happy 
multiracial, uh, everybody's happy uh, country, which is not true. Just, it's just not true. Statistically, you can see, um, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the exact, exact numbers, right? But let's say 90% of the, the, the rich are white, 9% of the poor are, are black. So there's no, there's no racial democracy. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else question? I, I have one more question, and that is, you've talked a little bit about um, the content, and I know that you also referred to the form of that. It's Black History Month. And so I'm just wondering if the form of this grammar that you're talking about um, reflects what could be considered in Brazil um, identity, culture, heritage, right? So the lyrics are talking about issues, right? But the, the multiple forms of discourses we've talked about in the disruption, do you think that's reflective of, of identity, culture, heritage in any particular ways? I, th I think it is not, not as explicitly as it is here in the United States because you guys never had the racial, the myth of racial democracy in here. The, the myth of racial democracy really had an influence on how black people perceive their identity. Uh, I discovered I was black when I was 13 because the police started harassing me. I never thought about it. So some people in Brazil become black and of course, I'm talking about a category, right? Some people in Brazil become black at the moment they realize that they are seen as black. And then you, you start thinking about your heritage. Where, where do you come from? Because you, you, all, you always thought that you were just born in Brazil and that's fine. You, it's a racial paradise. And then we start to rebuild or build or try to, to achieve a, a, an identity. So rappers in Brazil, um, I, I am not, I cannot speak if they are, they were 100% sure of this construction of reconstruction of, or a quest for an identity uh, that is uh, related, connected to, uh, to the heritage. Um, because Mano Brau once one time said, you know, he said, I, I, we don't know, we, I, like, I didn't talk about him today, Carlos Marighella. Carlos Marighella was uh, murdered by the dictatorship in 69. He was a um, Afro-Brazilian. He was probably the most important um, um, figure, one of, the, one of the most important figures in, in, in the fight against the dictatorship in Brazil. And, uh, and he was gunned down the street. He was never considered a political crime, criminal. He was always considered a common criminal. And he was an Afro-Brazilian Af 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 person. Um, and then um, Manu Brown, they, they discovered him. We didn't know there was a black guy fight, fighting uh, against the dictatorship. And then that uh, raised their curiosity. They made a, a rap about him uh, to honor him. So again, things things are were so fogged up, right? So so uh, so uh, difficult to 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 see that we. Again, and I, 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 I usually I compare uh, American rap and Brazilian rap. I didn't do, I didn't do this today, but I usually do. Um, that we don't we don't see it like uh, very clear when the heritage was broken, when the when the chain was broken. I think chain is a bad metaphor. <laughs> when when the, the the connection was broken, and then we have you know to dig and to rethink and try to, to find this identity. And with all the contradictions, right? With all the contradictions, if you talk, up, if you talk to another person from Brazil who is Afro-Brazilian, that person may say something completely different from me. I have been trying to explain to people 
that I now that I live in the United States, I have been living here for, I think, 14 years. And I have learned a lot about African-American culture and all. Now I have trouble saying the word negro in Portuguese because of the influence of the way the word, this word in the English version, uh, both like right? both words, they are uh, they, what they represent. Um, but some people in Brazil say, no, I am negro proudly. I'm like, okay, I know that is, a, a, you know, you resignify the, the words and all and that. Um, but uh, I think it, in Brazil, it's too complex to talk about uh, black identity because of the myth of racial democracy. Great, thank you. I think there's one more um, question is, what does racionais mean? Well, um, I think I should. I think I should find out that answer because usually people ask me that, and I just cannot translate. Uh, I am a rational person. I'm a rational man, uh, someone with reason, someone with. Uh, uh, and I think that's the meaning. That's the meaning. That it's like it's like uh, I don't know. What does this word "rational" mean in English? Like I'm a centered person. I am, you know, I am a, a person with a, a goal in life. <laughs> I love that. I love words that can't be translated. Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it's always been hard. People ask me that, and I always feel like a like a dumb because I can't <laughs> explain. Uh, but it, it, it actually it, uh, uh, there is a legend that a legend. Uh, that they borrowed from, like, again, from a, another Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian uh, singer. Uh, he had this music and they, so allegedly they, they borrowed from the word racionais from that. So you can be irrational. I, okay, irrational, that is a nigga, right? Irrational, that guy is an irrational person. It is the opposite, you are a rational person. And that's and that's that's what that's what that means. I think if you can, uh, ooh, it is well, it is a noun. Someone is asking why it is a noun, an adjective. It is a noun because now it is a name. Uh, but I think originally, originally it is, it is an adjective. Adjective. Mm. Well, thank you so much. I want to ask everyone to give Paulo another hand. You can unmute yourself so so he can hear that. It's really wonderful. I just feel like I've learned so much and we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. I think this proved that this pandemic needs to be over so I can get out and speak English to people. So I, <laughs> I regained some, 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 some of my ability to speak in English. <laughs> I your, hope. your English is just fine. Yes. I hope I hope it made sense. <clears throat> well, thank you and thank you all. And there is we've got uh, in the chat box a link for a quick survey. So if you want to click on that, you can do it after we, we, we've left the room to just let us know how tonight was for you. This is how we make sure that we're always improving our programming. If you just take a couple of minutes. And I also want to announce next month's um, talk in this series. It's going to be Tuesday, March 2nd, which is uh, at 6 p.m. again, Mountain Standard Time. And it's Francisco Galarte, Trans American Detritus, a study in trans femicide. And I will. Um, read you the first sentence in the description. Galarte's presentation focuses on the photography series En La Pista by Mexican artist Teresa Margolles. Galarte focuses on Mar Margolles' use of portraiture to capture a snapshot of the lives of trans women in Juarez, Mexico and the transitions of the border. And that's next March 2nd, Tuesday, six o'clock please join us. I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. Paolo, once more, UNM, we love collaborating with you. Have a wonderful evening and uh, we'll see you in a month.
Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Margo. Bye, Marina. Bye, Francis.